Hello, everyone. We'll be starting our webinar very shortly. We're going to give it a few minutes so that people can filter in. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Erica Nelson, and as the co-founder and co-director of the Humanitarian Geoanalytics Program and the lead of the Signal Program at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, I am honored to be hosting this webinar on data, maps, and spatial analysis for conflict and atrocity prevention. The Harvard Humanitarian Initiative is a university-wide academic and research center in humanitarian crisis and leadership. Our mission is to create new knowledge and advance evidence-based leadership in disasters and humanitarian crises. And the Humanitarian Geoanalytics Program, which resides at HHI, leverages geospatial data and analytics to transform humanitarian research, programming, and education through the practical, effective, and ethical application of spatial analytics. The SIGNAL Program very specifically focuses on how best to design and implement spatial methods to support atrocity prevention activities worldwide. Now, as many of you know, conflict and atrocity prevention has evolved significantly over the past decade. And it now includes increasingly sophisticated methods such as remote sensing, social media interrogation, and complex prognostic modeling. While these methods are being used in very diverse ways for funding, policy, and programmatic decision-making, there is still a significant divide between what is available and what is being utilized by practitioners on the ground. Thus, during this discussion, we hope to explore how data and specifically spatial data and methods are currently being used, the challenges of data in these spaces, the potential, and then the next steps regarding the roles of data, maps, and spatial analytics in early warning and early action for mass atrocity prevention. 
With that introduction, I am honored to introduce you to our panelist of experts. Firstly, we have Andrea Bartoli, one of the initiators of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes and the president of the San Edigio Foundation for Peace and Dialogue. We have Rose Collette, a development and peace building specialist and administrative officer for Partners in Peace. Laura Mills, a geoscientist and the co-founder of Data Science for Sustainable Development and GIS for Peace. And Ismaila Guy, an expert in the field of GIS for human security and a GIS and mapping program officer at the Economic Community of West African States Commission in Abuja, Nigeria. To start off this discussion, I'd like to open us up with a question for each of our panelists. That question is this, what role do data and maps currently play in your or your partner's early warning, early action for conflict and atrocity prevention activities? Andrea, let's start off with you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I think it's a very important conversation and it's very important what you stress that the, the, the whole sector is really changing fast. So I will focus only on Sant'Egidio and GAMAC, the two, uh, not, not speaking about other partners and so on. But I will say that uh, um, uh, when, when I focus on Sant'Egidio and GAMAC, it's very clear to me that uh, um, there is an enormous shift when you are focusing on peacemaking and when you're focusing on prevention. Because um, it's very clear that uh, data and maps um, play a very marginal role in peacemaking um, and a major one in prevention. And so uh, when you are working on, on peacemaking, as we do regularly at Sant'Egidio, and we have been doing it for a long time, there is, a, there is clearly a, a marginality that has to do with the usefulness of the data, the usefulness of the imaging and the usefulness of spatials and so on. And also, so in, in, I remember very clearly, for example, the first time I remember using maps uh, effectively or still already in the 90s, you know, in Mozambique, um, cantonment was an issue where the troops are, who is who, where things are and so on. So it's very clear that spatial is very decisive in those cases. But the um, general um, use of maps and data can almost be distractions in peacemaking. Well, in, uh, um, in everybody's asking, you know, why this, why not, why now, what is this and so on. When you are working on, on prevention, the situation is completely different, and this is the case of Gamma, because you are co-creating an emerging system. So what is happening now on atrocities prevention is that states themselves, not, on, not only NGOs, not only academic institutions, are actually engaging with new systems. And this is, you see it clearly on Gamma. Gamma is a state-led initiative that focuses on atrocities prevention. And in that context, uh, um, spatial and maps are definitely very helpful. Thanks, Andrea. Rose Collette, I invite you to answer the same question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Erica. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. So, hope you can hear me clearly. Can you? Oh, good, good. Okay. So, um, data and maps. Yeah, and like um, Andrea said, uh, I'll be speaking specifically to what it, how it helps, and what it does for my organization, Partners for Peace, and um, the creating organization um, that um, um, paint. Okay. So. Data and maps. Um, my organization, like I had mentioned earlier, sometime, um, were kind of um, I'd say, um, um, an information providing organization um, with data for uh, conflicts and uh, and um, uh, atrocity prevention. Yeah, so we we more like um, generate data and um, put it out like um, to the institutions responsible, so such that um, we can engage um, the responders. So how does it help us? Data and maps really help us. It shows, it shows, it shows conflict trends and patterns, right? That's 
that's what one very basic thing that data maps does for the partners for business. But data and maps again really helps us to identify conflict hotspots, right? And identify um all the thematic issues um with a particular conflict for a particular conflict pattern. So and, and essentially data and maps helps us to visualize um or rather helps stakeholders visualize um 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 conflict trends in particular places or uh, in particular locations you know to um such that such that they prioritize intervention as quickly as it is that they can so yeah data and maps um um have become like um andrea said um a very it's been, i think it's been there but i think that um it's been put to a better use as that the world evolves um i think and so um it's been very, um, it's been a, a very important aspect of what we do in Partners for Peace and a very important uh, aspect of our early warning and early response mechanisms here. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. Go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> um, going off of Rose Collette, um, I have a similar angle that I want to talk about as well. Um, and I'll start with grounding it within what DSSD does as well. So um, for those who aren't familiar with us, we provide data science, GIS, and software development services to organizations that frame their work within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we're very cognizant that the humanitarian and peace-building worlds are, are going through digital transformation as our every sector really. So um, we, we've been dedicated to giving very customized solutions to our partners in that way, especially our, one, our partners in peace and early warning, early action, um, and also collaborating on upskilling just in terms of the use of the safe and effective use of data. But something that we've been noticing in the past um, couple of years through our partnerships is maps and spatial data specifically are very appealing tools within the peace building community. And we've been really thinking of, of why those tools specifically, as opposed to other um, data science methods, other software engineering um, you know, type interfaces. And we've kind of come to the inclusion and in, in stripping it down. Peace is very equivalent to um, mitigating opportunities for future conflict. And this relies on nonviolent collaborative decision-making between parties and shared spaces. And then we've also determined what better way to deal with conflict in space than with maps and mapping tools and technology. So whether it's adding spatial data and helping that to elevate uh, current data repositories or having static and interactive maps that are presentation tools and are constructed in a way that's appealing to stakeholders in peace that are usable and readable and can help people identify imprecision in data, but then also gaps in where we need to go next, uh, next steps. Uh, maps are really the key way that we have been able to connect to the peace building um, world and, and use tech for, for good in that aspect. So um, I can talk about our work a little later in that aspect, but that's how we've been seeing it. I really appreciate that insight, Laura. Thank you very much. Ismaila. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Uh, maps, data, spatial analysis for my organization. As you said, uh, the ECOWAS uh, economic community of West African states. Uh, when we established the organization, it was focusing more on integration. But later on, as you know, some crises. Uh, civil war, uh, political crisis happen in the region. And uh, it has a, you know, uh, the change, you know, has a, a repercussions of the mandate of the organization. And the organization is focusing on security, uh, peace, you know, and we have uh, the early warning, you know, department, you know, and as you know, when we talk about uh, early warning, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, talking about events, we are talking about situations. That's why we are collecting such data related to events, related to situation in the ECOWAS region to monitor the human security, because the early warning approach is focusing, the ECOWAS early warning is focusing on human security. And uh, the data we are collecting, it, uh, they are enabling us, you know, to, as uh, Rose Clet, uh, uh, said, to have trends and also to see patterns, to see also hotspot and to see new threats, because I think it's something very important. When you are analyzing data you are collecting, you may see some new 
you know, uh, threats, you know. And uh, as we are talking about the prevention, I think it's, it's something very important to be able, you know, to identify those those threats. And uh, also, uh, it's, uh, the data and maps they enable us to identify areas of vulnerabilities, you know. And I think it's something also very important. And they help us to provide timely and accurate information for decision uh, making. Yeah. So um, I think is uh, what I can say for now in terms of using data and uh, maps is really helping us in the area of uh, prevention uh, uh, in uh, human security. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate kind of that greater picture of, of what's being done now, um, how you find it is influencing your work and impacting the populations that you're hoping to serve. Really briefly, just for the audience, when we're talking about spatial data and, and spatial methods, there is a pretty diverse uh, kind of universe of spatial methods. Everything from your basic thematic map that everybody is familiar with, all the way up to predictive analytics that I believe kind of Ismaila and Rose Collette were alluding to. We can start to see trends that, that provide you with information about kind of how you need to engage in that space in order to prevent conflict or atrocities from occurring. And so we're not just necessarily talking about, you know, points points on a map, we're talking about higher level statistical analysis sometimes that allow us to identify hotspots, predict trends, uh, identify vulnerability as, as Ismaila was talking about, and even noticing kind of new threats or new variables that could influence conflict or atrocity prevention. So um, very excited to talk about these things moving forward. I did want to mention though, as I apologize, I did not mention before that all of the things that our lovely panelists are saying are their own personal opinions and are not indicative or representative of the organizations with whom they work. Um, so just as a disclaimer, I apologize for not putting that up front. Um, so kind of delving into some of the next uh, questions, which is really thinking about like, while you are currently engaging in the use of data or spatial methods for your work, what are some of the challenges that you're facing around capturing, managing, utilizing data? Um, and, and how does spatial data have a special uh, kind of role in that space? What is the difficulty therein? So uh, I think I think maybe we'll go in reverse order this time. Ishmael, I'm gonna put you back on the hot spot. Um, so tell me, talk to me about some of the challenges you faced as a GIS specialist in this field. Okay, thank you, Erica. Uh, as a GIS uh, expert, uh, uh, we are facing uh, some challenges using, using uh, data and uh, spatial analysis. Uh, and the challenges are many. Eh? They are many. Uh, you know, uh, in the area of uh, prevention, uh, conflict prevention, uh, as you need data, but data, it costs. It costs, you know. So you need to have the human resources, you need to have the freedom finance, you need to train people, you need also to have a good system, you understand? And all this, you know, sometimes it can be very challenging. How to maintain the system and how to, you know, uh, the kind of data you are putting inside, you are collecting, you have to define indicators and all this. And data, uh, uh, managing data, uh, you know, it, it can be something uh, uh, time consuming, you know? And it needs also capacity, you know. And uh, also sometimes uh, you are collecting data from different source, sources, how to put them together, uh, you know. Uh, this also is uh, something very challenging. And uh, uh, it's not just about collecting the data, but what about the users, the analysts, you know? Uh, do they have the capacity to interpret, to understand? You have to put it in a, a way, you know, uh, the users will be able to, you know, to, 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 to use it. And also, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, the, how do you call it, uh, 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 the, the data, you know, they should be accurate. 
you understand? <laughs> they should be uh, uh, timely, you know? They should be verifiable, you understand? So um, in the case of uh, ECOWAS, sometimes we are facing with uh, representativeness of the data, you understand? One country may report more than the other one, or they may be reporting more on some uh, aspect, you know, the other one, you know, some, some uh, you know, these are uh, some challenges we are facing, you know, uh, in, in uh, uh, the in ECOWAS uh, regarding uh, data collecting and uh, uh, data analysis. There's Thank quite, you. Quite a few challenges. I really appreciate this. Um, Laura, do you have more that you'd like to kind of add to that part of the conversation? I do, and and just to echo the the variety along that theme, I think something that we've seen in conducting different spatial analyses, uh, specifically in this space, is really a lack of precedence sometimes. So I, I can give an example, but we, you know, and there are a number of data sets that are um, look cataloging violent death data, and usually it's coded by time and geographic location. We're working with one such database and trying to map imprecisions in the data where they where um, there were gaps in it and when you when you look and research how others have done it it's something that hasn't quite always been touched before and and trying to fit it into a methodology especially ones that don't necessarily relate to um, humans and, and actual people and lives I, I think um, data is great out there and when you look at remote sensing a lot of times you get climate variables you get your agricultural variables and I think that's great and I think there are volumes of data out there but it's not necessarily transferable within a piece space so sometimes you really have to develop your own methodology that's what we had to do we needed it to be sensitive to um, the type of data that we're using and thankfully it was it was a start and I think uh, we look forward to people adding within that space but it's really a lack of precedence, and then a, that transfers to what was said about you know missing data, um, gaps in data, and how it's done from different geographic areas of the world, from country to country, even from region to region, um, as as granular as it can get. Um, and Erica, you said you know what what can spatial data provide in terms of addressing challenges of overarching when it comes to data in the space? I think spatial data and remote sensing and things like that have been used to uh, fill these gaps, but it also presents other challenges in terms of adding that human element to it, increasing granularity. So opportunities are there, and it's definitely fixed a lot of problems in terms of what data we have, um, but there's a lot more to do. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate I appreciate talking about the granularity and interoperability of data. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was like the the human aspect of of of, of data, and I'd love to get into that in, for, in just a minute. Um, but Rose Collette, I would love for your insight here. Oh, oh yeah, I'll now just just going by what Laura Mill said. Um, there are a whole lot of challenges when it comes to, especially when you talk, you think about the interoperability of all that. But but anyway, I'm going to be speaking about the challenges that are specifically, uh, specific rather, to my organization, right? Okay, I'd start with this. So the use of data and maps is um, comes out also beautiful and also interesting. But like she said, Oh, no, no, rather, not just like she said, like we, we encounter a couple of challenges. I think more like it's Myla said, number one, apart from the fact that data is kind of difficult to get or maybe expensive or yeah. So there is that thing about data giving trends, conflict trends and all, but it does not really adequately give the background stories of some of, uh, of, some of the issues, right? So you actually have data about something, but it doesn't give, oh yeah, you have the trends, you have a, a whole lot of things speaking about the data, but not the actual drivers of like some of mm -hmm. the conflicts, right? And so you, you have data, but it's not digestive, if you understand what I mean. Uh, and, and again, we have the, the yeah, we, we, we um, data helps us um, access and identify our hotspots, um, but doesn't seem to reflect on actual realities. And let me explain what I mean. So looking at what we call the peace map, our peace map in um, the Partners for Peace, you have a really nice map, and then it, 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 um, it updates um, daily, probably weekly, as um, the data is generated to show hotspots, for instance, 
And sometimes you can just conclude that the hotspots are coming from a particular region or a particular location uh, just because the, it's always there, it's updating every day. And, but in reality, it may just be that the people who, the field officers who are generating this data are more in a particular region than they are in other regions. So it's easy to stay back and conclude, oh, this place is a hotspot. Oh, there is always something going on here. Oh, oh we need more um, responses here. But in reality, it could just actually be that some other field um, data um, generators in other parts of the regions or in other parts of the country are not probably not doing enough or are not enough to uh, you know constitute generate as much data to show of um trends to show off patterns to show a, you know that's that's um a very major challenge to my organization another one that i have always thought about is our peace map like i had said before has limitations so um if you hover over the peace map you most likely have um, trends, conflicts, issues, depending on how they are um, coded and imputed at the time. You'd see the, 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 the nation, you see that this is okay, this is Nigeria. You're probably able to get it to a region, maybe South, South, Southeast. And uh, you can also get it all the way to states. You can identify a state, for instance, you say Lagos state, and even in the Lagos state, you can take it all the way to say identify a local government, for instance, you say Ikeja local government, but that is where the that is where it ends. So you see that for a first responder, that's a very huge problem already. This is a big challenge because you can the the limitation doesn't let you take the the identify the actual community, the actual location of some of this. So that's a very major challenge for some of us. And then the the, the thematic areas are interrelated. Let me uh, let me let, let me explain this further. And so you you can there is there is no way to say that um gang violence for instance is not cannot be a driver for communal violence or that um political violence cannot drive communal violence and so at a time at a point of um putting this data together there is that challenge of separating these thematic areas because some of them cannot even be isolated from each other that's that's another challenge that we we'll have um, and and i think that my very last challenge is the validity of data you know, with um, the social media thing with, and there is even no way you can, you can, you can, you know, you can think to compare information. You can think, you can decide, okay, let me try to see how I can get from different contexts and different, and compare them. There is also no way to determine if these people are sourcing this data from the same place. Uh, well, nobody actually could exactly how this information was generated sometimes all because of misinformation disinformation and rumors and all that so those are some of the challenges that um, we encounter in our organization with special data and maps generally yeah I, I appreciate that it feels like every every time we we talk about any kind of analytics whether it be spatial analytics or something else it always comes down to the quality and validity and completeness of data and the bias that is inherent in our data collection mechanisms or our data validation mechanisms but i think that uh one of the other components one of the other things i want to talk about and dig into is is thinking through kind of like this hum human component um of of you know what do we what happens when we leave out qualitative data or how do we bring in qualitative data into this and what are the harms of leaving it out? Andrea, did you have something you wanted to say along those lines? Well, the first things I would say that the challenges for us uh, uh, have been around three major areas. One is coordinated intentionality. How do you bring together different intentions and very often contradictory intentions? The second is access. It's very difficult to get good data in many, many situations. And three is verification. You can get data, but you don't know if the data is truly expression of something. And when you start speaking about qualitative dimension is even more because clearly what you are um, capturing is not only a body, it's not only a fact, it's not only an objective reality, but rather the expression of a personal experience that needs to be translated. And there is 
enormous difficulties, obviously, in uh, creating codings that really capture this kind of uh, dimensions. Um, I do think that uh, as a general um, observation, I think it's very good for us, and it might be good also to go into the, the question that people around the world are sending. I'm actually quite touched to see how global this conversation is, right? And my impression is that we are simply becoming human in a different way. We are first uh, able to look through maps and through spatial knowledge to ourselves differently. We can see ourselves from a distance. We, we can see ourselves through methods that were simply unthinkable to our ancestors 50, 100, 200 years ago. And uh, of course, as Laura was saying before, we are stumbling. Sometimes we are doing things for the first time, but there is a little bit of an excitement about doing something for the first time, right? Because especially when you look at um, atrocities prevention, it is actually a fascinating uh, shift collectively, because in many ways, you have still a lot of areas of the world in which committing atrocities is considered good, positive, a victory by the stronger, uh, more armed, more capable side of humanity, but it's certainly considered a defeat by all the others. So the advantage, one of the advantage of any map, of any um, uh, spatial um, intelligence data gathering and so on and so forth, is to create a space of knowledge that is actually shared, that can actually be debated, can actually be verified, where the coordinated intentionality, the access and the verification is not a problem only for Sant'Egidio, it's a problem for all of us as humanity, as we become this humanity, that is able to even use this kind of uh, systems. Andrea, I love that. Like the idea of us becoming human in a new way and doing so through kind of a spatial narrative. I love that. I think that's really beautiful and bringing us to kind of the shared understanding of a circumstance or creating a, a common operating picture so that we can kind of share in these challenges together. So I really, that's beautiful and aspirational and I, I love it. Um, one of the questions that we have from our audience and I was hoping perhaps one of our practitioners could take it on, is to really kind of dig into how GIS and data is used to inform decision making. So if we can like literally walk through the data to decision making process, um, but I, it seems like Ishmael has something that he would like to add to our conversation. So I wanna open it up. Oh, thank you, Erica. I just wanted to add a few words on what uh, Andrea just said. Uh, yes, we can have with the data uh, baseline, quantitative baseline, you know, uh, uh, identify hotspot, identify vulnerabilities. But what we used to do in uh, ECOWAS, uh, I already mentioned we have the system to collect data. We have field monitors in each uh, member state. Uh, we collect event data, we call it also situation we, uh, weekly, and the events is daily, you know, when events, uh, you know, incident or uh, happen. But what we used to do, because our system is open source, I think as uh, um, Andrea said, we need more collaboration, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, intelligence, yeah, intelligence also to add to the open source. But we used to conduct time to time studies to go on the field you know, and meet people. And this will help us, you know, to just uh, reconfigure our system or, you know, to just, uh, you know, verify the, the data we have collected over time. So I think uh, we need to couple all this, you know, not only collecting data, but also time to time to go, you know, and meet people on the field and, uh, you know, do some research. I think it's something uh, we do in uh, ECOWAS, you know. Thank you. That's what I want to do. 
No, I appreciate that, Ismaila. Um, I, I also really like this idea of calling out for collaborators and creating more of a community of practice around this work, uh, not only just for data completion or uh, data accuracy processes, but also to really increase our capacity as, as um, a group of practitioners, as a group of people who are very deeply committed to atrocity prevention. Um, going back though, uh, Ishmaela, I'm gonna put you back on the spot. Um, to see if, if you wouldn't mind kind of walking some of our viewers through the data to decision-making process. This is something that several people are really interested in. Like, talk to me about, okay, so we've collected the data. Talk to me about what you do on a daily basis to look at process, what kind of, what kind of analysis you do. How do you uh, bring that out to your, your decision makers and how does that inform decision-making? Ishmaela, are you still there, sir? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so in the case of uh, ECOWAS, uh, how uh, the process from data to uh, decision making, you know, we have a workflow, you know, uh, data collection, data analysis, and, uh, you know, recommendations, you know, options. So that's the workflow, you know. So. Uh, when we collect the data, do the uh, 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 treatment and everything, so uh, uh, the analysts now they will uh, produce reports, and those reports they are going to decision makers. You know, giving them you know the uh, situation analysis why to respond to the question why this you know interpretation and all this and building scenarios. What can be happen? What will be the best you know, scenario in, and all this? And make also recommendation. What the decision makers, you know, they, 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 they can be different. You understand most of the time, they are different, you know. So for specifically uh, uh, any, uh, all the stakeholders, what they should be, what they should do. So that's how, uh, you know, in ECOWAS, uh, uh, that's the pro process from data collecting to uh, uh, decision making. So, so what I am understanding, um, kind of both from your first your first introduction on how you're using spatial data and this conversation, is that you're taking data, you're identifying trends, vulnerabilities, threats, and then you yourself are putting together essentially recommendations for these decision makers. Uh, and utilizing that spatial data and those insights in order to support those recommendations. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. You know, the, the, the analysts, uh, they will dig in, you know, to go deeper based on the data given to them, based on the quantitative reports and the graphical reports which was given to them. And they will be working, you know, with the GIS unit in charge of the. Uh, data collection and so the analysts they will go deeper okay to produce reports you know which will go now to the management uh, to the uh, decision makers you know in the report you know they have to uh, you know answer to questions why this why this you know and, and so they will make a recommendation that's how you know uh, from data to decision making at the ECOWAS level one element that I wanted to add, uh, thank you, Ismaila, for this, but is that in, in terms of uh, genocide prevention, one element that is very important is actually historical data. Is, there is something very important about maps that are contemporary, that are immediate. You know, that is, that we are all sharing this immediacy of the, of the world uh, as we speak, right? But there is also a, a, a whole array of uh, of, of maps that actually are historical in nature and are very important because especially when you look at uh, genocide prevention, it's very important for many countries to be aware how the killing happened, how the atrocities happened, where the bodies are, where the memory is and all this. And I think that it's very important for all of us to appreciate that it took a few thousand years for the world to happen as we are experiencing it now. And when we're looking at map, especially, we do need to be 
um, respectful of that kind of length. Um, and, and to add on that further, uh, in terms of historical data, I think also the power of, of spatial analytics and just spatial data is it very much has a real time element to it and in, or a near real time element. So in all of these workflows and processes, as you accumulate data, it also needs to be an updatable system. And I think designs need to take that into account that it will be adapted to rapid changes in conflict. Um, I think that's uh, a, a characteristic of this field. And so it needs to, you know, whatever system, or if it's a map, if it's interactive versus static, if it's um, a data repository that has spatial data, it needs to be able to be flexible to change um, and incorporate that well, and then also show that to the people who are operating with it. Thanks, Laura. I want to reflect back on something that Andrea mentioned, and that's that's the power of, of history and historical information and how we got to where we are. Um, I'm going to tilt it a little bit and say this understanding how historical variables led to atrocities is a really critical step in us understanding how things move forward in contemporary times and and honestly this is even how we do regression analysis right like while while Andrea was talking perhaps a little bit more around uh, the theoretical kind of digging in of like qualitative progression from, from a quantitative standpoint, we can look at historical data and create relationships to that, like between them through spatial methods and be able to potentially understand what might be the conditions for future atrocity or future conflict. Um, and I think that is really important for us to not only focus on the contemporary or, or near real time data, but also to incorporate a lot of that understanding and knowledge um, from, from previous experiences. So um, we actually had a very specific question, which was what kinds of data are we actually talking about, right? I think that we're, we, we talk about data very largely in this conversation. We talk about everything from quantitative to, to qualitative data, um, but what specific indicators, what specific data are we collecting? So for, for example, Rose Collette, what kind, of, what kind of variables are you collecting and, and processing and sending out to your communities? Yeah, okay, so considering that, of course, you see that I work for Partners for Peace. So yeah, we collect data around conflict trends and and all of it. And um, it just doesn't have to be conflict trends. It can also be um, data on issues to help um, avoid like a relapse to a conflict. So issues that can um, contribute to a post-conflict reconstruction, reconstruction or um, Issues of uh, a pre preconceived, or probably a pre uh, issues that can trigger conflicts, drivers of conflicts. It can just be anything. It can be uh, the data can be as little as okay. I, I think I should walk you all through how we actually collect data. Yeah. So my organization um, will have this large network, very large, over ten thousand people, and uh, so what we do is um, there is like a platform. It's like an SMS platform, right? That everybody has access to. And so the whole idea is these people are in communities. They're called peace actors in different communities, in different places, in different parts of the uh, of the country. And so what do they do? The people um, are taught to send a quick SMS of something that you think, oh, this is a conflict trigger. This can be, oh, this has been driving conflict in this part of the, and look at where it is going now and all. So there is like a collation center for all of these text messages that come in thousands. So you can imagine from every part, there is that um, 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 data that drops on the SMS platform almost every, of course, every day in, in, the, in droves. And so this is the kind of conflict. So you can, like I said, it can be as little as, oh, we've just noticed that some herders are destroying farmlands in A, B, and C community. There is a way that the platform is designed. It is designed in such a way that um, as, you're, as you're sending, you're sending and you're giving uh, real-time information and specific information. So the platform, the SMS platform has community, um, like community to the exact point, maybe how, where the farmland is located and what you, what is, what's going on here. Now, as, um, as, um, as a way to cross-validate, right? 
um, there is also no way that you you would um, rely on the validity of that kind of information coming from. So we use other the other platforms that are used to cross validate, and that's that's what the, our analysis looks like really before mm -hmm. it is eventually put out. So what kinds of data do we collect? We collect, like I said, data that will that can address pre uh, pre conflict drivers. Maybe um, drive, drivers of conflict and that, that is already um, probably happening, and um, issues that can probably also help post construction, post um, reconstruction, and reconstruction, yeah, post conflict reconstruction, and all that. So, but most of the, of course, all the data that is that we collect are all data that are around conflict, around conflict trends, around the patterns, and all that. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rose Collette, for giving us some more detail there. Andrea, did you have something you wanted to say, sir? I, I just wanted, I was scrolling also while listening to the different, in, to, to, the, to the question on the chat, and there is uh, Stefan Lang that is asking about this issue of criminality and the knowing the data, but being unable to intervene. And so I wanted mm. to make a pitch in, in terms of gamma on why it is reasonable for a state to take genocide prevention seriously because the issue is really not just a generic condition but rather a, a, a realization that every state is actually always somewhat fragile you know i live in the united states uh, it's, uh, it's very clearly a strong country a very important country and yet you can see the signs within of extreme fragilities and um, uh, the prevention of atrocities the prevention lens is actually the expression of a desire of effectiveness of governance there is a there is a, um, a an orientation of intention from the state side that goes in the direction of intervening and taking seriously all the signs that go in the direction of a possible genocide, of a possible mass atrocities, of possible human rights violations, and so on and so forth. So I would like to revert the, the question to say, at least for what I can see, and GAMAC is clearly growing as a community, right? These are countries like Argentina, like uh, Armenia, not, not just uh, you know European stable country, Tanzania, and so on. So these are countries that clearly experienced some form of uh, atrocities in the past, but they, they realized that rather than uh, giving up and, and uh, letting the territory being controlled only by criminality and violence, it is much better to use data um, as a way to um, redouble the effort of uh, uh, strengthening governance. I appreciate that. Thank you, Andrea, for making us look in as well. Um, I want to recognize the time and kind of push this conversation a little bit futuristically, um, really aspirationally ask our panelists, how would you like spatial methods to evolve within the atrocity prevention and conflict prevention fields? And what would be the potential impact of that evolution? Laura. Sure. So I think I have a, I have a two part answer to this. Um, but I think I think, first of all, when it comes to the evolution of, of spatial tools and methods, I think really collaborations, but, you know, across sectors, so cross sector collaborations in this way, um, especially, I guess, more related to my work in between tech and peace building, having technologists who have that technical expertise and can transfer that to peace builders who have the context specific knowledge. I feel like continual encouragement of those types of partnerships is essential to making those um, spatial methods and tools, uh, you know, proliferate. Um, but also, I think this is something that was highlighted throughout this uh, this webinar, but I think a more formalized and maybe even like ecosystem based consensus over how we build these collaboration and how we use these tools in this context specifically, um, because we're, we're seeing that um, 
you know, the, the question of, uh, you know, crises are still happening, even though we're collecting data and we're strengthening our, our tool set. So how do we how do we stop that? But that's really uh, a wider breadth of stakeholders that are all connected. So that interconnectivity, um, but then also um, standards for how these collaborations can really go on. Um, speaking from just a really broad data science perspective, you see organizations who all want to do it. Uh, you know, everyone wants to integrate data science, but there's a huge gap between those who can successfully do it and gain value in doing it and those who, who cannot. So it's trying to fix that within the peace and EWEA sector um, and just enhance that coordination. I think the tools will, will follow along in how they are used and, and strengthen from there. I'm happy to add just a, an idea in terms of the future you know my my dream is that uh, you know we will become almost like weather forecast you know an open platform a shared platform a verified platform because if that's the case then of course this knowledge becomes um as i was saying before you know um knowledge for humanity as a whole you know the weather doesn't necessarily distinguish between one country or the other you know the weather is clearly one you know there is there is a an ecosystem that is very clearly global um will will ever be that i, I don't know obviously because con conflict and atrocity preventions are political dynamics and so it's very difficult to reduce them to um to to this kind of uh, collaboration but at least you know the, the hope is that we will move in in creating a global system open to cooperation that would be the dream i love that dream andrea it's a beautiful dream all right in our last nine minutes i would love for our panelists to either add to those wonderful aspirational ideals of how do we use spatial methods for atrocity prevention. But I really want everyone here to give us one concrete step that we as a community need to work towards, implement in order to further the usability and the impact of these tools for conflict and atrocity prevention. So this is a call to proverbial arms, if you will, um, to all of those watching this webinar. Let's start with Ishmaela. Okay, thank you, Erika. So one thing we can do in the area of uh, early warning and atrocity uh, prevention, uh, how can we strengthen the early warning systems? You know, I think it's something very good how uh, we can uh, support as doing uh, like an assessment to see in which area, you know, we can support the systems in terms of data collection, in terms of uh, data analysis. I think these two component is very, very uh, crucial. Uh, how we can enhance, you know, data collection, how we can deepen analysis, I think is something uh, maybe in the future, you know, as community, we should see how we can, you know, help in those areas. Lovely. Rose Collette, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I think um, like, and I think I've also always said this, I think that my, for me, the very major um, thing to do would be to create some kind of awareness of the availability of these tools, first of all. And if we're able to create an awareness of the availability of these tools, uh, uh, we probably also need to build um, maybe organizational capacities, I don't know, maybe capacities in different areas to not just let people know that these tools are available, but also usability to let people understand that how to use these tools and how effective they are in data generation, in data analysis, and of course, in pushing out the narratives and all. That'd be my thoughts. Thank you. Andrea, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, on my side, I would say that, that, that the two most uh, important um, um, uh, make is, is really learning and, and sharing. Um, learning because um, I was really touched when Laura was saying uh, there are many situations in which we encounter new things, you know, these are new uh, data sets, these are new situations, these are new scenarios and so on and so forth. And I think that we need to be very aware of this um, 
um, responsibility of representation, this, this responsibility of creating um, data and maps and uh, space imaging that is as uh, expressive of reality as it is possible. But also the learning dimension, because I think that um, um, the more we enter into this kind of sophisticated uh, technological um, engagement, we realize that a little mistake somewhere can really create extraordinary results. And we need to be extremely careful about uh, verifying the data, verifying the way the data is received, verifying the way the decision making after the data is received is actually um, implemented and so on and so forth. So there is a there is an element of learning that is always present and there is an element of sharing that is always present exactly because I don't think that we can be, I don't think that we can trust uh, automatic responses. We really actually need to look at the entire effort as, a, as an effort of responsibility, as a collective responsibility, as a way for humanity to collectively express this responsibility of reducing intentional human death, reducing intentional abuse of human rights, you know, this intentionality of creating a humanity that is a little freer, a little healthier, a little better in many ways. And the data um, dimension as a way to accompany this process that is clearly a collective one. Andrea, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate everybody's comment around this idea of creating a community of practice and creating a learning environment and, and engaging in this capacity exchange um, because we all have things that, that we can share, but we also all have things that we can learn. And through creating this kind of community of practice that is in conversation with each other, I feel like we can really build up kind of uh, spatial methods and atrocity prevention efforts concomitantly in a way to really truly uh, decrease this, this intentional human harm that Andrea was discussing. Um, Laura, I apologize, we haven't gotten to you. I'm gonna give you just a quick minute and then we will wrap up. But luckily what I had to say really um, echoes what everyone else said. Uh, I think my, my one thing that I would highlight is uh, we, we are aware of, um, this wanting of collaboration, but I think how we need more strategy in terms of how we make those linkages between um, organizations even tighter than they are and how we, we really accelerate how they can work together. Uh, people are busy and people are, are, are doing have massive responsibilities in this space. So how do we make that um, easy? How do we transfer skills and knowledge um, in a way that is highly effective, but then also, you know, um, it's, it's going to have repercussions in the future. So uh, these tighter linkages and strategies around those is what I would say. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Not only uh, the call to action, but also having intentionality <laughs> around how we do this and being really aware of um, the limitations of, of everybody's capacity um, and really trying to potentiate our work as opposed to adding more Zooms to your life. Um, <laughs> so with that, I want to kind of reflect back on what we talked about today. We talked a lot about uh, data and the use of data for conflict prevention and atrocity prevention. We talked about how difficult data, collecting data, verifying data, breaking apart and val validating and understanding the bias behind data. We talked about building out spatial literacy within our communities, not only what are the tools, but what are the value adds of those tools. And we talked about how difficult it is um, to incorporate these into current workflows. What are some of the challenges that we need to address as a community? And how do we really start to address those challenges through capacity exchange, through um, really building up uh, internal organizational capacity, but also creating kind of like relationships to be able to kind of build out this greater community of practice. Um, so I think that's where I'll end. I know that there have been a plethora of questions that we have not answered, and I apologize deeply to those of you uh, who did not have your, your uh, 
your questions answered. We'll try to go back and look through some of those and perhaps we can uh, reflect back in, in an email to those of you who have registered. Uh, I do want to put a call out to anybody and everybody who is watching this. If you want to continue to be a part of this conversation, if you want to be a part of this community of practice, if you want to work with us or reach out to any of the panelists here, um, please, 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 please be in touch with either myself or my research coordinator, Syra Khan, who uh, hopefully will drop her email in the chat and we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Uh, I also wanna put a plug out there uh, at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. We are actually hosting a, an in-person workshop on humanitarian spatial technologies coming up in June. And we would absolutely love for folks to come and be part of this conversation and learn from us and teach us as well. Um, and with that, I wanna say thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you. Cheers.